Uh, per welcome, per uh, Kotagama, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dieters. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, from molecules to something that is much more close to heart, I think, greenery <laughs> and organisms that you said. Well, what I was trying to do is uh, basically ask this question also, research and research applications for national development. It's not a pleasant story that I tell. I always have to criticize because I have never had a good story to tell uh, with respect to the status of the biological diversity that we have in this country. Unless we wake up, uh, it's not going to change. And I want to just illustrate to you why we are not changing or why, why should we be changing. Uh, central to the conservation of wildlife is the in-situ approach. There are so many ex situ approaches which I will not touch on that is outside the protected areas or outside nature. I want to just touch on the in-situ area because we have almost 13% in the wildlife sector and we have about equivalent 10% from the forest sector. If you put the two together, we have 23% protected areas in this country. That's far too much, one would say, because we are a small country, but then we are proud that we have 23% as protected. But how good are they with protected? That is the question. Under the Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance, we have these different categories from strict nature reserves to national parks, nature reserves, sanctuaries, buffer zones, and marine parks. We have them defined, we have them identified, uh, we have a mechanism from which we can uh, recognize these things. They are areas where some activities are permitted and some not, like for a strict nature reserve, it's only research that is allowed. But if we ask how much of research is been done in any of these strict nature reserves, I would say nothing. Uh, I don't think we have even given any permission in the last couple of years to work in any of the strict nature reserves because that's the only thing that you can do in it and that also you are not allowed to do. So this is the reality we have to be. National parks, we have almost like 20 now. Uh, visitors are permitted. Everybody can go and see this fauna there, the flora. Uh, but if you ask what are the national parks that are in the country, everybody will say Yala. So I often say forget Yala, 50 square kilometers, and it is making a lot of money. So I think there is no question about money for research. Because if you really want, you only got to divert that income and you have a lot of money for research. So by destroying just 0.5% of the 13% of the forest that you have, you can have a lot of money for research. Why I say this is because this is the common thing. We don't have money to do research. There is money generated within the country from visitors who come to Yala, which is a mess. Always vehicles, park, all problems with everybody wanting to see one animal. These protected areas represent an approach to resource use and provides the multiple flow of benefits to society, the common things that we have. They are looking after our, our catchments. Again, something which I often say and which I want to address because uh, in a forum like this, it is important for us to recognize things for the future if we are really interested in getting the basic into the applied field. Almost 40% of the protected areas that we have in this country is a result of development. A lot of people don't like to say this, but it is a fact. If not for development, we would not have the largest sanctu uh, sanctuary in the country, that is Victoria, Randenigala, Rantande. If not for development, we will not have the Galois National, uh, National Park and the sanctuary systems. If not for development, we will not have the Madhuru National Park. If not for development, we would not have the Udawalave National Park. And I can go on. So we must also recognize that development has provided opportunities for conservation. 45% of the land in the accelerated Mahavali development project was protected. But what have we done after that protection? What research have we done to ensure that protected declaration is sustained? That is the question that I like to pose. The research must end somewhere also. So this is the allegation that we always have. We are doing basic research. But what is basic? Today, if we are talking about conservation biology, there is nothing called basic, which you would have just seen. What is basic in looking at molecules? They have applications somewhere down the line sometime, which you have to recognize. 
So the managers need this information to enable themselves to manage the systems because we are seeing ourselves very clearly that many of the protected areas or many of the areas which are the last areas where the fauna and the flora can remain without influence of humans are becoming islands in the middle of development. Those islands are therefore influenced by many factors and we need to ensure that those factors are reduced, those threats are reduced, and that the manager is given full strength to enable him to manage. He needs few information. Five basic topics, the inventory. He needs this inventory. If not, what is he looking at? What is inside any of these protected areas? Specific inventories, dynamics of population numbers, this is what we want. He needs species information. Because to date, our conservation has been basically been based on species. And therefore, he must know information about that species which is in the system for him to say, well, it is living healthy or it is declining or increasing and so on and so forth whether the food is available or not. He must know what interrelationships that exist in the system so that he will not see somebody collapsing while the other is doing success. Because he was given the custody of looking after all species within that managed space. So he had to look at the relationships of each and every one and make sure that there is no discrimination and nature is looked after as it is needed. He has to monitor and therefore look at these dynamic changes. Changes that are happening because of naturalness, because we have gone away from the good old days of static equilibrium to dynamic equilibrium in nature. We have changed that in ecology. So we are looking at change, but that change must be something visibly not damaging. So there is always this question, is a threatened species really threatened, or is it on the way out? Because extinction is a natural process. So should you stop it or should you permit it to happen? So these are questions that are very difficult to answer, but he must have mechanisms of how to monitor it and how to ensure what is there. If he does something, if the manager works on it, he must have a mechanism to know where he is going. So certain manipulations must be monitored and he will also have to manipulate in order to achieve objectives of the management system. So he have to have these things recognized well. As I said, they are not found to be connected as we want, but they are found in the midst of this development scenario. Right around many of these protected areas are people. In Singaraja, where I work for more than 30 years, there are 22 villages. And these 22 villages are often and all the time pressing on Singaraja. Singaraja was protected because of logging. Because that was the only place that was having the trees that was needed for a plywood factory. The plywood came in because of people were conscious to save trees. They didn't want to waste 35% of a tree when you finish with the product. So it was a good intention, but in the wrong place. But if you look back again, it is not also in the wrong place because everything else was destroyed by the time they decided Singaraja was the only place to go. It is that we said, don't go there because that is the last place. You have destroyed everything else. Now you want to destroy what is there, which is the last place. Fortunately for the natural boundaries from the e north and the south and from the east, Singaraja was saved. So we humans didn't do very much until we decided to chop it. Then only we woke up and we said it needs to be protected. And we achieved it in 1978 for political reasons. I say it very clearly, for political reasons. But of course we managed to change it because those who were there looking at the pros and cons of whether it should be locked or not locked, gave a statement to the effect that there is no scientific evidence for or against logging. And the decision to not log was political. So what would happen in this country, as, as usual, as we can see it happening today, you change everything that has been done by a former regime. You just keep changing it. That is the norm of the Sri Lankan system. So we were advised by those members who were in the commission, if you are really in interested in ensuring that Singaraja is saved, find the scientific evidence to prevent it. And that's how we went into Singaraja to do the research. 
if not for that basic information of the inventory, if not for the basic information of knowing that when you log, certain species are affected, if not for the information that we gathered that substitute forests can make disaster and change the composition of the fauna and the flora, Singharaja would not be the World Heritage Site today. Research changed the attitude. Research put the plug so that it can never get pulled out again. However, it should not stop from there. Because we are looking at a dynamic system. We are looking at a system that is changing all the time. Contributing to this, of course, I must not forget the plant scientists, the Gunatilakas, the, Guna, the uh, Savitri and Nimal, and of course, uh, Professor Bal Subramaniam, uh, Kulasuria, all those from Peradini. It was a collective team from University of Peradeniya doing most of the plant work and some from Sri Javadanapura and a lot of fauna work done by University of Colombo, March for Conservation. We seal the information through research to ensure that Singaraja is worth a world heritage site. Twice before in this country, in 1933 and 1956, it was recommended that Singharaja be declared as a strict nature reserve. And at both places, the need of the country was timber, and because of the timber needs, it was deferred. But now, by the research, we proved that the species presence, the impact of logging, and for the future, that this is a unique place and it needs to remain. So you can see that good research can give good results. So has this not happened in the wildlife sector? It has happened. But the sad story is that it has not worked. Way back, before 1992, actually, I think the slides have got messed up. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Before this, there was a very important project that started in, and I think it has came with it, from the Smithsonian Institute in 1962, 65, 65 to 82 the Ceylon Elephant and Primate Ecology Study. That is where it all started. So we did a lot of work. In fact, some people are surprised when I show these things. So how can you have this? These are maps done for Vilpattu, done by our survey department. You ask the wildlife people, nobody knows this. They don't see it even. They don't know. So we have done the very basic needs of a protected area for a manager. The inventory was done by the Smithsonian. Plenty of publications. The basic ecology of the elephant was done. Maps on soil, hydrographics, topography, vegetation, movement of elephants. For Yala and Wulpatu are available. These are the last set. Because I asked the survey department, they also don't have it now. So this is all data gone. So we have done research. But the question is, was it applied? Why did we do this? The question then stands there. Have we not wasted a lot of money? So that's why people say, you all are doing research, but nothing is happening. So there is something that is not working. Right, then I want to show you from here. We come to 1992. Before that, we had the Mahavali Environment Program, 84. 89, where the Mahavali area we did work. Again, we have done a lot of research and we have produced a lot of documents. Systems plan for the Mahavali accelerated protected area systems. Each of those parks that were declared, 45% of the development area was protected. This was not in the map when it was started. But because of uh, effort through the environment committee, it was possible. So everything is here. But then we go and look at the Mahavali system. We have all the problems still remaining, nothing resolved. Then comes this project, 1992 to 2000. This was inventories were done for like eight protected areas. I just mentioned only a few. Commissioned by the principal system in this country and the world grant systems, consultants. Not researchers, consultants. Temporary experts, I call them. And you get them to do the study, collect it from somewhere, put it together and say it is there, 
no validation but then you have to believe what is in the text and so you have an inventory to start with based on in this inventory management plans were prepared unfortunately the management plans were prepared by the consultants from abroad so we decided we were not going to accept that so we rejected all of them these are facts don't think that i am just blubbering out but we have to know your younger generation must start thinking seriously about where we want to go then we had another project i think it is the next one where everybody protested against it the conservation community said no don't bring this adb project this is going to destroy even the remaining protected areas that we had unfortunately i had to happen to become part of this because i was called in and said do something the project is not working from 2000 it is idling can you do something i said sure if i can if you give me a chance i will do so i was made the deputy uh, deputy leader of the project without any assignment my tor was advice 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 so that was very good because advice means not doing anything no? only talking <laughs> like this so i had the opportunity to advise to do what should be done but in that process we redid all the management plans and the ownership was handed over to the department of wildlife conservation in other words they did it we did it but still they are on the racks this is 2015 and i know that nothing from those projects documentation was properly implemented so it stands there so research yes we are doing but when it comes to the application we are far behind we did a gap analysis because every one of us here if you know anything about the protected area network we know that it is lopsided out of that 23% more than 20% is in the dry zone only 3% is in the wet zone but in terms of the richness and the value of the biological diversity we know that it is in the wet zone not in the dry zone so we did a gap analysis and showed that there is a lot of gaps in respect to the biogeographic regions of the country and that they need to be covered to date it stands as a book on a shelf nobody has used it only one attempt but it didn't work we have a lot of invasive species we have a project working today on invasive species trying to get rid of it but how far we are going we don't know we initiated after a long time the outreach programs research was done to understand why people like or dislike protected areas or how can we make them like protected areas today the outreach unit is one person in the department of wildlife conservation so this is the application the research was done we also did visitor survey research so that is why when people say there's a problem in yala i say forget it just let it go it's only 50 square miles let them all go there and have a traffic jam but don't let it happen in any other park that you can so i want to just jump in with the little time that i have to the biggest problem with the biggest animal now we have three molecular people no so permit me to at least tell something about the big animal the human elephant conflict everybody knows we are losing 150 elephants we are using about 50 people every year this has been going on and on and on and there are over 425 publications by 1998 because there was a nice seminar which was held national symposium on elephant management and conservation 3rd 29th 30th may 1998 since then we have not had a big one so that's why i am holding this up in which there are 425 publications with respect to elephants peer reviewed scientific publications common articles in newspapers everything is there but then if anybody says there is no information i would say that must be something wrong with inability to read english because it's all there more research has happened since with respect to what we are doing so the smithsonian starts it and i have just put the monkey study at polonnaruwa continues to do it to date and i let us will permit me at the end of the 
speech to say something about applications of research on monkeys also. Studies on genetics on elephants was done by Prithviraj Fernando. Aspects of crop damage, all of these were done. So we have a huge amount of information. How many elephants in Sri Lanka? These are all the numbers that are documented in the literature. We have had 10,000 around 1900, and today we have 7,379. Very fact exact, no? 79. But you can see that the number has fluctuated as 750 to 800, and go on all the way up to 6,000, 2,500, 3,000, 4,000, all of that. So when we use these numbers, everybody says, you must be very cautious about talking with these numbers because these are not factual. There is no science behind this. Yes, there is no science behind this. That's what I also believe. But then these are numbers. Numbers on which at sometimes we argue and say this is it. So that is why we went on saying there is a population decrease. Elephants are going down, elephants are going down. And when this came out in 2011, of course it didn't come out in 2011, it came out in 2013. It was done in 2011, but there was a problem uh, with the publication because there was a name that should be or should not have been, and therefore it went back and came out only in 2013. You see, I was one who said that this is something wrong in this science. So I'm happy that late Charles Santia Pille had the courage to put my name in this publication and to say this. Thus the survey of elephants carried out in August 2011 represents the first truly national survey to be carried out across the full range of the species in Sri Lanka, including the war ravaged areas of the North and East. Nevertheless, there was one courageous individual in Sri Lanka who realized that there were far too many elephants than was previously estimated. The island newspaper, the Daily News of 1994, quotes Dr. Sarath Kotagama's timely warning of the impact of a growing unchecked population, elephant population, on the island's resources as follows. Let the animal activities say what they want. The elephants are multiplying at a considerable rate and within 25 years, sustaining Sri Lanka's wild elephant will put an enormous pressure on our economy. I am not the only one, right? Another point of view was expressed by the then Minister of Environment and Natural Resources, Mr. Champika Ranamaka, 2008, that the Sri Lankan elephant population, far from declining, could be reaching a saturation level and call for a comprehensive plan to protect and conserve the elephants. See, we are either re not responding to the available information on the guys that this is not scientific, and therefore we are not doing what we should, in the case which we should be, as scientists, focusing ourselves to get that numbers to enable us to go somewhere. But I was using something else. To me, these numbers doesn't matter very much. Because from all the studies that was happening, I could see that there was something of this nature, which I will substantiate from the ecology, using the science that has been done, which nobody has challenged yet. I await to see somebody challenge that. So 1900, we had 10,000. The numbers clumped down to 750 in 1958 comes from the Department of Wildlife Conservation Administrative Report. So it is up to us to either believe the Department of Wildlife Conservation or reject it, or wait for a peer-reviewed scientific journal to say this is the number. And then it has been going up, up, and you can see we are really looking at an incremental population. We are not looking at a population that was decreasing. That's why I said we are having an incremental population. This was substantiated to me by the ecology of the elephant. Because the ecology of the elephant studies done under the Smithsonian and many others have not rejected this premise yet, which says that dry grasslands have about two to four elephants per kilometer square. Marshy grasslands have 3.6 to four elephants per square kilometer. Scrub patches have three to 3.2 kilo elephants per kilometer square and forest all as only 0.2 to 1.5. This is from Ishwaran and Punchibanda of 1982, and there are many others, Van Kulenberg, Mackay, all of them come up with the same similar things. So forests, tall forests, don't have elephants. So I got my students to work out 
How many elephants are there in Vilpattu? How many elephants are there in Vasgamo? And how many elephants are there in Udavalari? I got them to draw maps from the satellites. Calculate how much of these habitats are available. If these are the proxy values of how many elephants can be there in a square kilometer, if there are hundreds square kilometers of grassland, just multiply that and you will get 20 elephants. Very simple mathematics. Maybe crude, but you get a crude carrying capacity. And we got for Udavalave 300 elephants. And that is what everybody says. There are about 300 elephants in Udavalave. So we are not bad. We are close to it. So these things were done. The food habits were documented in the ecology. So it's very clear that it is there. They prefer secondary vegetation. They don't like tall trees. So to me, it was an obvious reason. They are an aged species. They like the water. They like the places where there has been destroyed. They also like where there is grasses. This is the place where they will hang around. Not in the true forest, not in the grassland by itself, because our elephant doesn't like the hot sun. They always need the cover. And Therefore, they come close to humans. The interaction is inevitable. This is the story at the end of the day. Forest cover against preference. You can see the red line shows the preference of the elephant to the habitat. High forest, it prefers less. Gradually, it will go up. As you cut and chain up, agriculture they love because you provide permanent water, permanent grass, everything is provided, good chocolate, right? They love it. And then as you more settle down and reduce your protect, uh, crop varieties in your home garden, they come down and when you come to the city, there are no elephants because there were elephants here 150 years ago. Today, no elephants. So this is the chart of the preference. And that is the chart of the forest cover that we have seen in this country. So obviously, if the tall forest is coming down and the scrub is increasing and agriculture, the preference also goes up and then obviously they are not going to sit down and only eat. They have many things to do in life. One of it is, is to increase the numbers and they are doing it at a rate. You can see it. And therefore, there is nothing but to accept the fact that the numbers are increasing. So what was the solutions? We had electric fencing, which was stopped. We started in 74. Then it was stopped. Nobody wanted to do it. Translocation was done. They stopped it. Nobody wanted to do it because the criticism was too much. And then I come back into the picture in 1989, and I take the risk and do both. Today, we have over 2,000 kilometers of electric fencing. I decided that you have to cut 10 meters before you put a fence. To me, it was something that I learned when I was working in Kantale as a crop protection officer under one Mr. Solomons. He said elephants are very, very cautious. They don't like to come out into the open. So in order to protect the sugar crop, they said we should have a huge buffer with nothing. So I thought, yeah, that's good. That's true. Elephants come and mark time at the edge of the forest before they march out into the open and get to the sugar crop. I have seen it. So when I became director of wildlife, I said, if you are going to put electric fences, 10 meters without anything and put the fence in the middle. So the first fence was put at Udawalave. I also learned from Kantale that a human fence is even more effective than the electric fence. So we brought back the people who were resettled from Udawalave onto the other side of the road and put them right along the road. Today, if you go that way, you will see a fence and you will see the human fence and both work perfectly because the losses was so high that if we didn't do that, uh, late Lali Tadalot Muldi would have shot the elephants. Because that is what he told me. I will kill your elephants if you don't do something because I am losing over 200 million rupees every day. So this effectiveness of transforming that research, because we knew this information for application is what is required. We have 200 kilometers of electric fences today, but the problem is worse than what it was. Where have we gone wrong? A lot of work on the translocation has gone in. We did it, I did it, but today I will not do it. 
simply because today the science tells me that a translocation is a death warrant to the animal and a disaster translocation. The problem is taken from one place and put to another. So that is where I come with the wolf's story with the monkeys. We have done that and we have created problems so much so that my brother in my hometown says, you brought the monkeys. I said, no, 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 I was not the wildlife. <laughs> right? Don't tell me that. Right? Namut wildlife Even at Bibile. Right? Now no crops are possible in that area. So it has been disaster. So translocations will not work. And enough information is available that we should not be doing these translocations anymore. But we still continue to do it simply because people say do it. Because it's an action that you see. Drives, same story. We did many drives. Today we have enough information to say that drives are not successful. So where do we go from here? It's all there. So I just want to give you some comments here from papers that were there. We conclude that the problem elephants translocation causes intensification and broader propagation of HEC and increase elephant mortality, hence defeat both HEC mitigation and elephant conservation goals. These are from the uh, results that have been obtained by putting transmitters on elephants that were translocated. 17 elephants were collared, 15 of them died, the other two, we don't know where it went. 15 died. They all went all over. One fellow was named Brigadier also, because he went and broke the Brigadier's house in Sigiri. He ended up in the sea. He swam across, probably going to some other country, and then the Navy brought it back. Released him, and he went and ended up in a pit and died. So this is the end product. We are having this and we are not doing anything. So let me conclude now. The conflicts are not over. So we have a lot of information. We have a lot of basic research, but we have very little concerted, effective application. That is my message. What is wrong? This is what we have to ask ourselves. What is wrong? Why is it not happening? Why should we then continue to keep asking more and more and more research? Because that's not going to help to resolve the problems that we are facing in the conservation area. We are having more problems. Monkeys have become a huge problem today. The research tells us otherwise as to how we should be tackling it, but we still go and do the same thing that we do with the elephants. Catch the fellows and put them somewhere. And we had a small discussion. We tried to appraise of the situation. This is not how you should be going. You should be looking at some other mechanisms but uh, it's like that saying, you know, you, you don't play the violin to a deaf elephant. That's it. Peacocks have become a problem. Now that we have highways, you have the boat doors. When you go down south, you will see peacocks are hanging around this area. Right? We also had two planes. Now, of course, Matale is getting dislodged and broken up, no, so we won't have that problem. Uh, we had two hits at Matale with, on, with peacocks. And this, then wild boar. Always say so. Many birds, that is my area. I studied the pest birds situation. I can tell you it is getting very acute because everybody is making a living out of Indian corn today and they are having a lot of problems with the parakeets and the other birds. There are other issues also. Then we also have the pet trade and so many other conflicts are coming in the, in the uh, wildlife areas. All of these need information because without information, or the research you cannot tackle. But my conclusion is that we have the information. If only we are willing to apply that information in the correct way, we will resolve 90% of the issues. There is always going to be something down the line which is not possible to solve, but most of it we can. But to do that, we have to change directions. The directions that we are doing now are not going to help the animal nor people. We will only have to live with it. If that be the case, then let's not complain. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Research, professionalism comes by understanding the information properly and making it applicable for benefit in conservation. That's how I see professionalism. To be able to say it 
and not be hiding behind or shoving it under the carpet because somebody says you should not be doing it. I think we have a time now for conservation to change and I hope we will take that opportunity. So thank you very much. Subhanagatyak, Thirvan Sarvan. Thank you so much for your very lucid explanation and uh, presentation. Um, we'll give you one question and we'll save the rest for the effort for the end. Does anyone have a question? <clears throat> Okay, seemingly not. I, yes? Right, you have hit in, the... <laughs> what in, in your opinion, sir? You have hit the uh, nail on the head, or the hammer on the nail or whatever it is. Well, I wouldn't use that word because it's already happening. Yeah. It's just that we, as an organize, organized body, is not doing it. The people are doing the calling anyway. So should we allow the people to cull in the way that it is happening with horrific results of, to the animals? Or should we do it with a s system that we can accept? There are other methods. I, I can give you a lot other methods based on our culture. I did say this to President Premadasa, late Premadasa. So we have 30,000 temples. That means 30,000 animals. If you ask any temple, if we give you elephant, will you look after? They will say yes. After the end of Kali. So you have 30,000 elephants. You see, at the end of the day, what do you want? You want the wild elephant or the elephant? Because the number of wild elephants will anyway have to be reduced. So do you kill it or keep it? Because you can keep the elephant in captivity. And they can breed prolifically in captivity. We have the best breeding center in the world, and yet we call it an orphanage. Either we don't know English or we don't understand what we are saying. Right? We have the best breeding place in the world at Pinnavela, and we still call it an orphanage. Right? So we have solutions. But it's a matter of accepting captive elephants also as part of the social entity. And I don't think there's anything wrong in that in this country because today and in this week, if anybody wants to see the Perahara, it is the elephants. What not? On that festive right? note, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. We'll have, we'll have more questions later on. We need to move on. <clears throat>